Uh, it's not good. That hill giant's hitting pretty hard. I think I made them too strong. Shoot. Okay. Well, hey, this is marketalchemist.camp, and today is my day off. Today I am showing you how I built a game in Rust. It's a pretty simple game, and some people asked what I do when I'm not doing Elixir, or what kind of programming I'm into. What am I learning right now other than Elixir? The answer is I have been playing around with Rust. I found a really fun tutorial. It's called this Roguelike Tutorial in Rust Plus TCOD. And I guess this, uh, this library is something that was inspired by a Python version, or at least by other versions of it. It's on many platforms, and it handles a lot of the basic uh, ANSI GUI stuff, and it's also got some field of view calculations in it. Anyway, this tutorial has like 13 different uh, sections to it, and any given one of them is pretty in-depth. Well, maybe not the first one, but say I click something towards the middle, and you can see it's like a meaty blog post tutorial, maybe like a, a double blog post length tutorial. And I went through all of it, and then I started customizing things. It's, uh, it's been kind of fun, because I'm into game programming, or at least I that's how I very first got into programming in earnest, was I, I discovered Flash, and I, at that time I knew a bit of CSS, tiny bit of JavaScript, but Flash just made it so easy to get started. I uh, dove into it, and then getting that quick interactive feedback loop of seeing stuff on the screen, change as I changed code was really good, especially as a beginner. And then I got more into serious stuff and front-end JavaScript development and then back-end JavaScript development and Ruby and other stuff. You can see this whole game is only 2,000 lines of code. It's a little bit, a little bit under that. And I'm not pulling in a whole bunch of dependencies in Cargo. It's just uh, uh, basically uh, like a JSON serializer library. It's the equivalent of Elixir's Poison or JSON libraries, random number library, and uh, I believe this was also related to serialization. Yeah, this is a serialization library, and uh, Takad can set serialization as a feature. Um, and then this is also related to getting JSON out of it. I'm using this for saving games, so this is I've implemented a fair number of things in here, but uh, um, the basic structure is the opposite of most games that I worked on with Flash. Instead of having like some base object that everything inherits from, instead I've got uh, basically each kind of object, including say these are equipment items and these are spells. Um, all of these are basically just enums, so they they have nothing. They're just they're just the enumerated value, and that's it. And then the main object, let me scroll down to it. Uh, it has a whole bunch of uh, things on it, and a lot of them are options, including item. So basically, you just assign an item to this object, and then it's one of those. So if you want to have a helmet, you just create an object, and then you set the enum in the object you created to helmet. But helmet doesn't mean anything. It's just a number, you know, just like you know item number six or something. But um, all the rest of the logic in the game knows how to deal with this object and knows how to see what's in it. Um, so there's obviously too much to go over uh, in a podcast or in a, in a tutorial or screencast because I'm not even that good at Rust. I'm just learning it. I don't even know what I'm doing, and it's it's pretty lengthy. But some stuff I was, I was happy with is the tutorial covered uh, different AIs. So we have like an AI basic where the monsters just come towards you and attack you once they can. And there's an AI confused that the tutorial teaches you how to do. And I made my own for a sleep spell, which I added to the game. And um, when the monster is under a sleep AI, obviously uh, it just, uh, under a sleep spell, it has a sleep AI for a set number of turns, and then it just doesn't do anything, and then there's a message saying when it wakes up, and so on. So 
Uh, this is what the code looks like. I'm just going to show you some more stuff in the game because that's fun. So I've got this loading screen here and you can't see this feature because of the way that uh, I'm showing the screen through uh, my, my uh, screencasting software, but I've implemented uh, screen maximization and then going back to the original size of screen and you can see there are games that can be played and continued. Uh, I hit continue, but it just shows that my player's dead because uh, that was the last state of the game. So I'll play a new game here. See with the mouse, I can hover stuff and see that's a healing potion. The O there is an orc. And I have inventory of just a dagger. Let me get out of there, attack some orcs. You can see uh, I get an update of them doing two hit points of damage to me, me doing six to them. And I can get these healing potions. I can get those. And I can also drop them. So here, you see there's an orc, dead orc remains. I could drop one healing potion there. And now, when I uh, hover over it, you can see there's dead orc remains, comma, healing potion. So that's kind of cool. Um, can't pick up the dead remains, though. That would have been an odd feature. Down to six hit points. So I'm going to use a healing potion. Oops, missed, click that one. So I'm back up to 30. And kill some orcs here. And I'm gonna find a ladder down. Let me heal myself first though. Once there's a ladder, I can go down it. And then there's another level of the dungeon. These are all procedurally generated because it's a roguelike. So nothing in here was pre-created by me. It's a new map every single time. Ah, I leveled up. Uh, so I can pick either more constitution, just more hit points, strength, which will add to my attack, or agility, which will add to my defense. I'm going to add to agility so that now my defense is three, and instead of orcs doing two damage to me, they only do one. It's basically just uh, the attacker's attack minus the defender's defense is, is uh, uh, how much damage gets done, and nothing ever misses because... It's a pretty bare bones game. I spent about two hours a day for like three or uh, more like five days in a row to make all of this. Uh, the first uh, two days were just completely following what was in the tutorial. Then after that, I started uh, playing around with it and adding some things. So now I'm on the second level of the dungeon and I've got different stuff set up on each level. So like the odds of Monsters appearing are different on different levels. The odds of items. You can see I've got a new thing here, which is a scroll of confusion. I'll get that. I'm also going to... Yeah, that's fine. They only do one damage to me now. Got them. And now I'm going to grab a sword. So you can see my, my player right now. I have an attack of six. And in my items... See, I've got a dagger that's equipped. I'm going to get the sword, and now I'm going to equip the sword. It goes on the right hand. So now looking at my player, I have, wait, is that right? An attack of six. Oh, H. And the sword is equipped on the right hand. Okay, looks good. I've got the sword and the dagger. So now I have an attack of eight. And there's orcs really don't have a chance against me not that they did a moment ago they're they're pretty weak grab that healing spell and go down got another spell here what's that oh that's still confusion i think i color coded all of the scrolls to be uh, the same color each so hopefully we'll find a stronger monster here and i'll show you how that confusion works just orcs all right that's fine just go down to a lower level of the dungeon and find them. Okay, so you can see there is a troll. Um, it's got a T, and that does more damage. So the orc hit me for one hit point. That troll is going to do more. Let me uh, use that scroll of confusion. That's I, so I hit I. And now I left click which enemy I want to hit. I pick the troll. Now the troll is confused 
and I can kill the orc while the troll just wanders around. Leveled up. I'm going to get constitution this time. And... Oh shoot, it's no longer confused. So I hit it for six hit points twice. Hit it for six, it hit me for five. So the troll's, uh, troll's quite a bit rougher. And there's another one. Crap. Uh, you know what? I'm just going to fight it. Down to three hit points. Use a healing potion. And the troll is dead. Go down the stairs. And now, oh, we've got a scroll of lightning bolt. That one's a fun one. That one uh, isn't targetable. It'll just go after the closest monster you see. So it's, uh, let me see here. Kill those orcs. I just wanna, I don't wanna waste it on, uh... oh shoot. Okay, that's a hill giant. And hill giants are way more powerful than trolls or orcs. So actually I wanna get this. So the hill giant just hit me for nine hit points. I'm going to get another scroll of lightning bolt. Now I'm going to use a scroll of lightning bolt. It wasted it on the orc. I'm going to use another scroll of lightning bolt. And bang, one hit, killed it, got 200 experience points, leveled up, and I'm going to get some strength. Okay, so that's enough. You kind of get an idea of how the game works. Let me quit the game again. Last little bit I want to show you in here is these uh, transition tables I set up for uh, when things show up and how. So I've got all these items showing up and there's you see this weighted choice. I've basically just set a weight to how likely each thing is to show up. So uh, you can see uh, the confused spell doesn't even show up until level two of the dungeon. And then once it does, it has a chance of three of showing up. And this chance of three, we're basically just adding up everything. And uh, uh, well, once for the items and once for the monsters. And if there are a total of say 30 points of chance, then this would have a 10% chance of showing up. If it were only six points of chance, it would have a 50-50 chance of showing up. Starting in level four, uh, the confused spells get more common. And, or sorry, level six, they start getting more common. They have a value of four. Um, healing potions basically are just consistent. Doesn't matter what part of the dungeon we're in. Lightning Bolt doesn't even show up until level four of the dungeon. And sleep spells show up at level eight. They're actually particularly powerful because you can just target one monster. Uh, it's not seeking the closest one. And uh, it's also... You know, just puts them to sleep. They don't move. You just go there and kill them. Um, there's one other kind of spell I didn't show, which is a fireball. That one's pretty fun. That does an area of effect damage, and you target it. Um, so similarly, different items show up at different points of the dungeon. And scrolling down a bit, I've got the same thing for monsters. So at the beginning, it's just orcs. Level 3, you start seeing a few trolls. So the orc, say, has a, a value of 70, which is just uh, this value is the chance it'll show up. And trolls are way less common than orcs. And then they get to be three-sevenths of as common. And then they're almost equally as common as orcs by the time you get down to level 7. Hill giants similarly show up at level 4 and get more common. Then I've added mountain giants and other stuff. So I'm thinking about just putting all the code for this on GitHub or something, but obviously, you know, I'm not gonna put too much more time into this. I just worked on this game and, you know, got it to where I could kind of mess around with it. Oh, and as far as my background uh, with Rust before I started doing this, I just had, uh, I got, went through like 10 chapters of the No Starch Press book on Rust, which is kind of a lot of people call it the Rust book. Um, it was a little bit tough in parts, not too bad. I mean, nothing wrong with the book, but there are some new things in learning Rust. It's nowhere near as difficult as the reputation is, but at least for me, there were some things like, let me, so this thing is basically, uh, it's a function that helps when getting uh, two mutable references 
to different items in the same list. So uh, just a little bit of background. In Elixir, everything is immutable, and that gives you all kinds of uh, advantages in terms of you know uh, concurrency and uh, in terms of safety. You know that you don't have two different things being operated on and changed uh, concurrently, and you don't have weird race conditions where you don't know which one uh, got changed first when you've got two updates happening to it at the same time or something like that. It just solves the whole problem by making everything immutable. Uh, if you've used immutable JS, same deal. Um, Rust doesn't do that, but it's it, it might seem easier because you, you do have mutable things as well as immutable things as you would in a language like Ruby or JavaScript, but it's very strict about uh, about the references you have to different things. So uh, you can only have one reference to something that's mutable at a time. And then once you have a mutable reference to something, you can't have any more references to it, uh, even if they're immutable. But if you don't have any mutable references, then you can have lots of immutable references to it. So you can kind of you know pick which way you're going to go. You're going to have everything be immutable, just like you would with uh, immutable JS or with Elixir or uh, some other languages, then no problem. Or you can have things be mutable, but you have to be very strict about references to them. The idea of this thing is if you've got a list of items and you want mutable references to two different items in that list, you actually only need one mutable reference to that whole to that list as a whole, but if you were to try to uh, take a reference to one item and then take one to another item, then you've got two mutable references to the same list, and that's not allowed. So this kind of like breaks the list up, and then you get a mutable reference to each one of those things in it uh, separately, so you don't have two mutable references to the same thing. At least that's uh, my basic recollection of how it. How it works and as I said this was from the tutorial I would not have understood this so this kind of thing was like a major uh, headache for me but for the most part I think yeah the, the learning curve isn't too bad except that one big difference with uh, with learning elixir or actually learning JavaScript or most languages I've learned before is in those languages, you don't really need to understand all the concepts to be productive. Uh, Elixir is a great example of this. Like you don't have to know how protocols work, and you don't have to know that much about OTP. You can actually make a Phoenix app, be really productive, do a lot of useful stuff without learning any of those things. And same thing with macros. And then later on, say you're writing a library, you can learn how to use macros, or say you're you know, you're uh, um, doing something with more sophisticated kind of concurrency setup, then, you know, you learn more about OTP and you can just kind of like gradually learn more and more and more. With Rust, I feel like, I may be wrong, but I feel like if you're missing something, if you're missing like core concepts, you'll just hit things that uh, you can't do at all as opposed to not being able to do optimally. We'll see though, I, I'm still pretty new into this. So for those of you looking for an Elixir tutorial, sorry I didn't have one this video. Um, hope you don't mind the distraction, but there are plenty more queued up. As I said, this was my day off. See you next time.